Greetings and welcome to our video service for the Sunday after Pentecost, coming to you from Trinity Episcopal Church in Lumberton, North Carolina. O God, you have taught us to keep all your commandments by loving you and our neighbor. Grant us the grace of your Holy Spirit, that we may be devoted to you with our whole heart and united to one another with pure affection. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Jesus came to his hometown and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue and many who heard him were astounded. They said, where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Then Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor except in their hometown and among their own kin and in their own house. And he could do no deed of power there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. And he went among the villages teaching. 
he called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. He said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you as you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. What do you think about when someone mentions your hometown? Maybe it's the site of your mother's garden or running through the backyard to get to your grandparents' house. Maybe your hometown holds fond recollections of your old school or playing summer baseball or walking to the corner store with your best friend. Maybe it's a creaky porch in the house that you grew up in or your father's distinctive recipes, those familiar smells coming from the stove. Maybe you remember how hot and sticky the summers were or the dozens of times your back ached because of shoveling snow. Hometown can be many things. A hometown can communicate comfort and security. There is something about driving on well-traveled streets, walking into a restaurant and seeing people you know or who know your parents and cannot believe how you've grown. There can be something very profoundly warm in such a comforting world. But sometimes some towns are less the stuff of dreams than they are of nightmares. Hometowns can trigger instances of trauma, resurrecting decades-old anxieties. Maybe the hometown of your memory is not comforting at all. Maybe they're pockmarked by being chastised for your faith or your lack of faith, or dismissed for your crazy political beliefs. Maybe your hometown is the place where you first looked evil in the eyes, where you were ostracized for who you knew yourself to be, what you wanted to do with your life. So hometowns conjure up all kinds of memories and emotions. And over the years, they become saturated with meaning and can even take on a life of their own. Hometowns can be life-giving and heart-rending and everything in between. And today, our gospel text from Mark recounts Jesus returning to his hometown with his disciples in tow. And for all the pleasant moments that might have been brought to his mind, there were, we hear, some pretty significant challenges. Now, the Gospels don't give us much on Jesus' upbringing. His family picture albums seem pretty sparse after the wise men depart from the end. But based on a handful of textual clues, it's safe to assume that Mary and Joseph were devout Jews who trusted in God's plan and provision, and that Jesus would have been the beneficiary of such a faithful upbringing. Remember that scene where the adolescent Jesus is at the synagogue for three days, sitting amidst the religious leaders, peppering them with questions? You could take that and run with it. Let your imagination fill in the gaps of his formative years. And 20 years later, Jesus sets out from his home invites some working class guys to accompany him and then begins his formal ministry. He's seen all over the place, traveling in and out of homes and villages and cities around the Galilee, teaching and healing and calling others to a new way of life. 
Along the way, Jesus utters some cryptic sayings about the kingdom of God and some near blasphemous statements about his relationship to God. Throughout Mark's gospel, he tells those who witness these sayings not to speak for fear that their testimonies will fall into the wrong hands. The word spreads, as words tend to do, and people flock to Jesus either for their own sakes or for the sake of another. Some want to be made well in body or soul. Others, it seems, want to see a miracle with their own two eyes. In the fifth chapter of Mark, immediately before our text today, the crowds congregate to glimpse Jesus casting out demons in the land of the garrisons. Others attend to him raising the daughter of the synagogue official and healing a woman with a blood disorder. Jesus has been busy and away from home, but the road now leads him back, back to Nazareth. And surely Nazareth was a place of some comfort for Jesus. Surely it held smells and sights and sounds that forced him to stop and think of playing in the dusty alleys or sitting down to Sabbath meal with his family. But whatever nostalgia flooded back was quickly stemmed by a demon of a different sort. And Jesus names it as a lack of faith, a collective inability to see the hand of God at work because of past assumptions. Where did this man get all this? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary and the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? Prophets are not without honor, except in their hometown and among their own kin and in their own house. If a hometown is a comfortable place, it's understandable why a prophet would not be welcome there. Prophets are not dictated by comfort or by custom. Prophets are driven by divine obligation. Hometowns are places often bound, bound by tradition, and sometimes they are paralyzed by precedent. Prophets come to unsettle, to startle people into new ways of seeing the world, and to demand them cease their spiritual backsliding. Hometowns occasionally toe the line of the status quo, but prophets disrupt the status quo, speaking light and life into the creeping darkness of what has come to be normal and natural. Thinking about a hometown is an exercise in thinking about the complexity of being human, of our everyday habits, some good, some not so good, it's about appreciating the intricate beauties of a place we've called home for years, but it's also about shrewd ways that we insulate ourselves, insulate our lives from failure, from fear, from those people. What are the hometowns we have created for ourselves? Where are the places of comfort that we have chosen to bring us grace? Where are the sealed off places where we are doing our best to insulate ourselves and create a nice clean life untouched by those that we deem unclean? It's understandable why we would be hesitant to let Jesus into any one of these spaces. Why would we want to disrupt what is good and cozy, especially in a world where good news can be hard to come by? Alternatively, why would we allow ourselves to be stretched and challenged for our lives to be undone willingly with all the awkwardness that can bring? Prophets are not without honor, except in their hometown and among their own kin, in their own house. It's uncomfortable to let a prophet's presence wreak havoc in the corners of your heart 
in your own house, among your own people, but letting God speak into what we think of as the warmest, coziest places of our lives might increase our soul's capacity for love for both God and for our neighbors. If we allow Jesus' prophetic presence to sink in, something like scales might well fall from our eyes, encouraging us to see those who were for the longest time invisible. We might start to witness walls of hostility and division come down or cease to be built in the first place. We might learn to welcome those whom we at one time labeled unsafe or other, a criminal. What might it look like for us to be disrupted by Jesus, the prophet, here and now? Well, there are no pat answers. Each life is different. It experiences grace and healing in a unique way. But I would wager that it would look like taking stock of how things have always been done in exploring how the church can proclaim and enact hope in transformative ways, opening ourselves and our communities and our neighborhoods and our nation to such a prophet is not easy. But doing so can bring about beautiful fruit and leave us, like those in the synagogue, astounded at God's works and God's word. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Almighty God, who has redeemed us and made us his children to the resurrection of his Son, our Lord, bestow upon you the riches of his blessing. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.